You are listening to the Uncanceled Podcast. We believe that Jesus came to set you free and nothing can cancel the truth of God's word. Now here's your host, the youth pastor of Impact Youth at Faith Church in New Milford, Connecticut, Pastor Joey Santora. going on uncancelled we are back come on that was a pretty good entrance that was it's been a long time it has been a long time we're back man and we are really better than ever man we're gonna we got we got some good content coming your way and back by popular demand we have a rate that that we have already done before but not for a very long time no it really wasn't but it was a good one yeah and it needed to come back. Recommended by some of our impact students in our uh, one in one of our student group chats. It is time to once again rate, rate that, that crumble, crumble cookie. cookie. Here we go. Come on, We're the back. The timing was there. Oh, We're back. Yes. All right. So. Um, he doesn't know what flavor we've gotten. What we're going to do is we're going to look at, um, he's going to look at the flavors of the week and try to guess which one I picked. All right. We'll see if he gets it right. It's going to be interesting. So there's no shot he picked a, a chocolate chip cookie. Like that's disqualified. Like I think it's fair for us to say that we're not going to do like a generic cookie. I'll like, tell you right like, now. Week. I absolutely did not get the chocolate yeah, chip I, cookie. Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that, would be, that would be so boring. All right. Cookies and cream cheesecake. Ben loves cookies and cream. Not so big on cheesecake, though. So that's the only hesitation that I have for that one. Double fudge sandwich. Uh, uh, is It's just like a, like a double cookie, I think, with some fudge in the middle. Um, ben likes that, but like I, I kind of feel like he would maybe want to go for something a little more creative. Although, if he did go with that one, like I, I could I could see see an argument for it. Patriotic fruit pizza, like like I, I just I just really don't think that he got this one. Uh, it's basically a sugar cookie with some fruit on top of it. So I'm gonna say no on that. Strawberry cake, I, I'm gonna say he definitely. Oh, he could have gotten that one. He does like strawberry. And then we have cinnamon crunch, cinnamon crunch. Should I give you any hints or no? No. Okay. Because. Because uh, I, wait, should should I let you should I should I let you narrow it down? Not, not a hint, but I was just gonna say, I wasn't only thinking of me when I got the cookie. Oh man, <sighs> I'm just I, I'm just looking at this right, and 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 if I'm gonna go based on what would be the most fun to try, right? Uh, I. Strawberry cake would be, I, I really like that, but I don't think that that is the one that you went with. I think that you went with, ah, oh, it's, it's either the cinnamon crunch or the, or the cookies and cream. I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the cookies and cream. Well, I guess we're going to find out. All right. Let's see. Let's see. He's one for one. Oh, one for yes. One. Oh, wait, we're going to do this every week. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. No, I mean, like, we're, I'm going to guess every yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go, man. He's no, one for one. I, I no, really I was, thought. Yeah. No, go ahead. You it, say why. You say why. 100% was between the cinnamon one and this one. And I am not the biggest on cheesecake, but I thought that it would be the most fun for us yeah. to try and, like, have yeah. a conversation about. So I, I think so it's interesting. Is this really a cookie? I don't really know. We're going to find out what the Lord's doing. <laughs> it's very hefty. You know how much calories these have? Way too many. I'm pretty sure it's um, 800. Are you sure that that's? Are you sure it's not for a serving? It's no. It's 200 for a serving, and I think it's fourths. See, I'm just not eating that. For th that that's too many calories for me. 100. percent so Like yeah. I'm good with like a sliver here. Anna Paula, like an eighth. And Leticia. That's still 100 calories. Anna Paula oh. and Leticia came in with crumble cookies to Monday night prayer. Oh, I saw. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Or I saw somebody had them on a Wednesday or something. They didn't give me a bite. That's just. Pff, pff. All right, let's Come see. on. Let's see what we're doing here. So I didn't want a bite. Uh, let's, let's see. Man, th this is a move. Is it not a cookie? Uh, dude, what is going Do on? Do I need to get a fork? 
Do I, I don't need to think run it's, like the wind. I, and get I a fork? don't think that it is. It it is a cookie. I That's kind of lame. It, it's. I mean, it's still. Is it a cookie? I mean, I I, I don't even know. It's in like what this is wrapper. a cookie? What is a woman? <laughs> yeah, dude, go get a fork. Yeah. Um, please enjoy this brief montage of. <laughs> please enjoy this brief montage of. Absolutely nothing. Oh, dude, that was pretty quick. I'm really fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that was quick. All right. I mean, dude, let's just chow down. Let's okay. go. Um, how are we going to do it? Oh, my God. What in the world, man? I'm a little out of breath. I did actually run. What do you mean? You just trans teleport. Te tele teleported. Teleported. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed that it's not. This is actually just cheesecake. Oh, shoot. But that's okay, I guess. All right, let's just go for it. I mean. Oh. Hold on. Did you get the bottom? Kind of is a cookie. It kind of is a cookie. I mean, you really have to work for it. You have to work for it, but it kind of is a cookie on the bottom. Just barely, but yeah. Yeah. It's it's got some good cookie crumble on the bottom. Uh, you can see like like it's a thin thin cookie on the bottom. Yeah, it is. Wow. It is. I really like cheesecake, guys. Yeah. Um. I I don't really like cheesecake, and I'm still like having a pretty good time. Mm. It's just like a tiny bit sour. Yeah, because it's cheesecake. I know. Then that's what I don't love about cheesecake. Yeah. But do you remember the one that your sister made for your birthday? Yeah, it was. It, it that was. was not sour. It was a cheese oh cake, my like gosh. ash. Like it was a. It was a cheesecake with cake. That was. That's why it wasn't as sour. But let, let's talk ever. about this for yeah. a second. So it's good. It is really good. It is. I. I don't remember the other cookies we rated, but we're just gonna scrap that there at this point. There was one. There was literally one. Oh, what was we it? did rate that crumble cookie. Um, we did an eggnog cookie because it was around Christmas. Oh, it was time. probably like eight and eight out of ten really or something don't like that. Oh, but oh, it's okay. What? I don't know. It's on my phone, but it's okay. Okay. Well, here's the thing. It's really good, but I, I will give it one complaint. I don't really love that Crumble comes out with non cookies and passes them as cookies. Yeah. Like I'm cool with them selling this, right? Let, like obviously, like do do your thing, right? You could sell a cheesecake if you want to. You could do like a like you can call it like a a something else. Like you can call it like a chucky, sure, like a cheesecake cookie or whatever. But like, I don't like that. If you go on their website, it it I think it says I think it even says like it's a, it's an Oreo cheesecake cookie. Let let me just let me see, or maybe it doesn't. It just says, mm, it kind of does say cookies and cream cheesecake, but it says cookie flavors at the top. Yeah. So they're promoing it as a cookie, and it's it's not really a cookie. I can't pick no. this up with my hands and eat it. Right. I wish that they just made the cookie a little bit thicker. Yeah, and they kind of brought the cheesecake down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that that is, is a good compromise um, and would have been even better. But even so, yeah. it's still very good. No, it is, and like... I've been, and, and like, uh, I, I have been really like, wa like, I pretty much always watch what I eat, except for like, if I go away or something like that. Like when I was in Italy, I wasn't watching what I was eating J just because like, I, I just like, I enjoy being healthy, you know, but I'm very tempted to eat this entire thing. Like, like, like it, it is good. Mm -hmm. It is a solid cheesecake. Um, it, and uh, in comparison to others that I've had, but I'm going to have to knock it a couple points because of it, the fact that it's not really a cookie. Um, I really like the cookie layer on the bottom. Yeah. The, the Oreo flavor on the bottom, the cookie yeah. itself is quite good. Um, and the cheesecake is, the cheesecake's good too. I mean, it it's, is. it's creamy. Um, I it is a little more sour than some cheesecakes. I'll be it? honest with you. I was going to say, yeah. I haven't had a whole lot of cheesecake. So like, it's good. I don't have a whole lot in my arsenal to compare it to, but like it was, it was a bit sour. And yeah, like, that's my knock on cheesecake in general. So yeah, this is a more sour one than okay. than uh, than probably even, some. Even so, like it was still it was still good, and the flavor was good. Um, 
I, like it tasted like Oreo because you like I I just think that the the cookie layer on the bottom needs to be a little bit thicker. Yeah, that's fair. I like I, I have thick. a I have a rating for it. I have a rating for it. I do too, and I don't love it. I don't love my rating, just so you know. But I think I I, I have a justification. I think I have to. Okay. Go it's kind of weird rating. that I feel the same way. Really? Like I don't love it. Like, but it is what it is. Yeah, sure. Gotta do what you gotta do. You do. All right. Three, two, one, eight. Four point nine. Whoa! Here's, Whoa! Here's my thing, man. I, like, listen. I understand. I get it. It's it's it tastes good. I wouldn't eat half of it, or or the whole thing. I wouldn't even eat two, three more bites, and not because like all right, it doesn't taste all good right. as like a cheesecake. But I don't like cheesecake. Sorry. You know what, man? I get it. I do, and you went four point nine. You went as high as you could I with went that. As high as like, I could. like I get I'll it. Give it a four point nine nine if you want. Yeah, no, that's fair. And, and the thing is, is that. That is part of our deal, and yeah. yes, even with the crumble cookies, because we could eat an entire crumble cookie in our l- l- like a hundred percent. Like we're not like we're not like these like you know small guys or whatever. We could eat a we could eat a, a uh, crumble cookie. Put that thing down. Hundred yeah. percent. So for me, it's an eight, and I actually didn't really love my rating because I uh, because I did like it, but I, I have a, I do have that complaint that it's not a, that it's not a cookie, and I think we're gonna try better cookies uh, as as the weeks progress. We are too. Um, and I'm. I'm looking forward to it yeah, and I'm curious to see what we're what we're gonna get. I mean, you never yeah. know. I hope that they have like a pretty broad like selection that they uh like cycle between it's every week. Well, I know it changes every week, but I hope that like next week it's not like three of the five are the same, but they added two more. Like I hope that it's like pretty fresh and like pretty new and we can yeah. keep it going for a little while. You know what one of the ones I really want to try is is the circus animal cracker uh cookie. I've been seeing that one going keep around. My eye out. It's uh, it, 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 it. Have you heard of it? No, yeah. I I don't really mess with crumble. Like I don't either, because I don't know. You're probably gonna you're gonna probably mimic or feel what I'm feeling with this. If I want something like this, I would rather eat like four Oreos or something like that, and call or whatever, and like. Or even eat like more than that, and like I'll, I'm still eating half the calories of this cookie. Yeah. That's why I don't go to Crumble Cookie because of the calorie. Intake. If I were really wanting a cookie, I would, and it might sound weird, I would just go to Big Y and get the the three pack of really really good cookies. I'm telling. Well, you. that's fair too. Even like economically, like what what was this? Four bucks? Five? This one was seven because it was more because it was this one. Okay. Seven dollars for a cookie, like seven dollars for a cheesecake. Yeah, like which honestly makes it maybe a little bit better. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, well, thank you for joining us for rate that crumble, crumble cookie. cookie. Thank you so much for tuning in, and now it is time for a new segment on the podcast: real reactions. See you there. What is going on, uncancelled? Welcome to. Our newest segment, which I told you was going to become a segment at some point, Real Reactions. We got Real Reaction. Here we go. All right. So being that this is just a segment, I don't want it to take up too much of the podcast. So it's really only going to be one to two videos every single week. And then we're going to get to a Bible teaching. If at this point you don't really want to watch the Real Reaction or whatever, no problem at all. Just go ahead and skip forward a little bit and you can go ahead and check out the Bible teaching uh, for today, which I'm super excited about, by the way. Uh, I, I'm really excited to just share that and then teach that topic. But uh, let's check out today's Real Reaction. I feel bad about this one. I feel bad about this one just just a little bit. And and here's why. I feel bad for that girl in that in that video because she really thinks what she she like really thinks what she says is going to benefit her because something that that has to be understood about this as children of God and as Christians cuz something that I've often heard and the reason one of the reasons I selected this real reaction is something that we often hear uh 
is, and not, not from students at Impact, but that people will say is that I'll get right with God later. I'll get right with God later. And they'll say, you know, I'm going to live my life now and I'm going to do what I want to do. And then I'm going to figure out God later. I went out to lunch with one of my friends that, that I played baseball with and I, and I told him the gospel. And he said to me, he said, you know, Joey, that's something I'm going to have to figure out at some point down the road. And it's like people are always pushing off right decisions until later. But the reality is, is a couple of things. First off, tomorrow is not promised. There is no guarantee that tomorrow you can, you can turn your life around or that tomorrow that you're going to be able to live because tomorrow Jesus might come back. Tom uh, tomorrow we might die. Something might happen. And now as believers, we believe in long life. But if I'm not under the covenant of God, that's not a guarantee for my life. But as a Christian, obviously, we believe the promises of God. But I can't just act as though that tomorrow is going to be promised to me. There may not be a tomorrow. As a Christian, there may not be tomorrow because Christ might return. As a non-Christian, there might not be a tomorrow because what if something happens between today and tomorrow? Not to mention the fact that it, uh, these things become an addiction. Drinking alcohol, getting involved in alcoholism, it's not just one of those things in, in your own strength and in your own flesh that you can just quit overnight. Obviously, with God, we believe that instantaneously somebody can be set free from alcoholism. But if somebody is trying to do it in their own flesh, what a what a dumb way to look at things to say, I'm going to do all of these things now, not to mention all the bad choices that can be made during those drinking years, quote unquote, where you're drunk and you're sleeping around and you're making decisions that could even make you uh, end up in jail. I, I had a, uh, th there's this uh, guy that I know that uh, uh, he was um, uh, was uh, um, kind of going through a hard time and I reached out to him and because I saw something on his uh, social media and I reached out to him and he called me one night and at this point he, he wasn't a Christian yet and he called me and he called me and I was talking to him on the phone. He said he was driving and, and something just fell off as I was talking to him. And, and I said to him, I said, are you drunk? And they said, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of drunk. And I told them, you need to pull this car over immediately because all it took was for them to crash that car or to uh, get in an accident for them to potentially spend the rest of their life in prison. That is what drinking will do to you. So I'll, I'll encourage you with the opposite. Instead of enjoying your drinking years until you have to go through the rest of difficult life, how about just do it God's way and you can have a great life for your entire life? Because what this reel almost implies is that your drinking years is when you can actually have fun in your life, but then you can settle down and have a family later on or settle down and live the rest of your life as if that's less. But the reality is, is that in God, you can live a full, fulfilled life that that doesn't have to be, okay, well, at some point I have to get serious about God or at some point I have to give up this sinful thing and that means my life is going to be miserable. On the contrary, uh, your life is going to be better because you're going to be doing it God's way and you're going to be blessed because of it. And so that's my real reaction for today. I hope that that benefited, uh, benefited some of you guys that are watching. And my heart really does go out for this girl because I want her to know the freedom that she can have in Jesus Christ. I never want my real reactions to come across as if I'm against the person in the video. Uh, I want them to know the truth of God's word just as much. So uh, my heart goes out to her and I, I hope that she comes to know Jesus Christ and sees that she doesn't have to live her life that way. So thanks for joining in for Real Reaction. Now on to the teaching. Welcome to the Bible teaching part of the Uncanceled Podcast. So glad that you stuck around and joined in. Or if you skipped uh, to the Bible teaching, that's all right as well. Uh, just happy that you're here to receive from the Word of God because all that other stuff, uh, well, specifically the rate that is just for funds. Uh, so uh, we have a good time with it. And if you enjoy watching, then that's great. But if not, happy year for the Bible teaching. Uh, today I want to talk to you about this. Here's my question I want to propose. Is confession biblical. Is confession biblical? And I'm speaking of positive confession. Is positive confession biblical? And my subtitle is understanding biblical confession. Um, confession, when we speak of positive confession, it refers to what you say matters. 
and what you say will make a difference in your life. And where you go in life will be directly correlated to your confession. Confession has been something that has been Um, how do I say this? Confession has been something that is looked at as a controversial topic in Christianity that people say, oh, you know, I don't know about that positive confession stuff. It's considered controversial. In fact, my Bible school, North Point Bible College, um, uh, they had a section of their library that was called controversial literature. And some of the books within the controversial literature were uh, confession books. And they called it controversial literature. Instead of just calling it what it is and what I believe it to be and what I'll prove to you today, just Bible literature. Now, I will make this comment because I did mention them by name. Things are changing at, at North Point Bible College where I went to school. There's a new president, President Tiff Shuttlesworth, who I honor and respect. And he's changing those things things over there. And that's a Holy Ghost. That's going to be a Holy Ghost filled school doing great things for God. So I'm excited for that. I was sharing about the time when I was there, when they had uh, that library, but I've actually heard that that's being removed and taken and taken away, which I'm happy about and excited for as well. But, uh, you know, President Shuttlesworth's doing a great job over there and I respect him very much, but that is what it, what it was when I was a student at the school. And that not only was that a thing at probably many Bible colleges, not just mine, where there was controversial literature, but also there are denominations who have actually written position papers against positive confession. Although I believe, and again, I will show you that the Bible says that it is, uh, that uh, positive confession is something that we should believe as Christians. And uh, uh, the most important thing though, in this conversation, no matter what this school says or what this person says or about what this denomination says or even about what I say is more importantly, what does the Bible say about this topic? What does the Bible say? Is confession, is positive confession biblical? And I want to take us through the scriptures because here's the truth. I I don't believe something if the Bible does not teach it. I don't believe something if the Bible does not teach it. And I know many people because I went to school with many people who did not believe in positive confession. They did not believe in positive confession. And something that I noticed is that there was not scriptural support to the fact that they did not believe in positive confession. And they didn't know what to do with the scriptures that did talk about positive confession. They tried their best to explain their way around it, but the, but their explanation ultimately fell short. And unfortunately, what I saw in many of those people and what I've come to see in many of those people that I went to school with that don't believe in positive confession is they constantly confess things over their life that are now their reality, that, are not, that were not good things that they confessed. Po- yeah, you know, life is, you know, life is hard. How are you doing? Tired. I had this one kid I went to school with, I would ask him how they were doing and they'd always respond, oh, just tired. And, the, and I'll be honest, you know, and I, and I don't say this in a way where I'm trying to be rude about, about anybody, but it's the truth. They look tired all the time when I see them. Every time that I see them, they look tired, they look down, they look defeated. Why? That was the con- constant confession of their life. Uh, I heard Pastor Joel Osteen tell a story one time about this guy that he knew that uh, when he was in high school, um, he asked him, how, uh, he would like say to him, uh, you know, how are you doing? And he would say, getting old, getting bald, and getting fat. He would, that's what he would say. He would say, I'm getting old, I'm getting bald, and I'm getting fat, or something to that degree. And Pastor Joel ran into him, I think like 25 years later, and, and they were like both 40, 45 years old. And Pastor Joel said he looked old, he looked fat, and he was bald. He was looked old, he was fat, and he was bald. Why? It was a confession. That confession brought him into a mindset. Why does confession matter? Well, because the Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if if that guy thought of himself as old, as fat, and as bald and confess that over himself, it, it wouldn't be long that he began, that began to become a reality in his life. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so that, uh, when you speak something out of your mouth, you're actually revealing something that is in your heart. 
that is in your heart. Confession matters. But I actually want to show to you in the Bible where confession is clearly shown to be biblical. Go to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. We're going to start here. Some people I went to school with would say, well, you know, Joey, this text doesn't really mean anything about, you know, confession like that. It's not talking about positive confession. And I think that they're wrong. And to be honest with you, my question would be, well, what does it mean then? But the reality is, is that this is not the only text in the Bible that you can find positive confession in. It's not the only text. You can find this in many places and we're going to show, I'm going to show it to you uh, in this teaching. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Where are death and life? In the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Or in other words, the uh, other words, you will eat the fruit of what you say. Death in life is in what? It is in our tongue. The things that we say matter. The things that we say uh, produce life or produce death. Death in life is in the power of the tongue. What you say matters. What you say matters. It matters more than you may ever understand or realize. The Bible clearly teaches that death in life is in the power of the tongue. Don't let your confession be a foolish one. I promise you, I promise you, because the Bible shows it. What you say is in direct correlation to the direction that you will go in life. Unfortunately, and as I've already mentioned, with the uh, young man that I went to school with uh, that said that he was tired all the time, and he always looks tired when I see him. The guy that said that he was getting old, fat, and bald. What happened? He got old quick, he was fat, and he was bald. Confession matters and confession will directly cor correlate to the direction that you go in life. But that's not the only place that the Bible teaches confession. Did you know that Jesus also taught confession? People get upset. Well, I don't believe in that positive confession stuff. Jesus believed in that positive confession stuff. Jesus believed in it. Mark chapter 11. Go to Mark chapter 11. Jesus believed in positive confession. Jesus believed in the confession of your mouth, mattering. The reason why I keep framing it as positive confession is because I'm not referring to the Catholic confessionals where you go to a confession booth. That is a separate conversation for a separate time. I'm talking about the confession of your mouth dictating where you go in life. Why am I in Luke? I don't know the answer to that question. That's okay, right, Ben? That's okay. Mark chapter 11, verse 21. Actually, I don't want to start in verse 21. I wrote down somewhere else that I wanted to start. I want to start in verse 12. <clears throat> it says, on the following day, when they, being Jesus and his disciples, came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, or a, a fig tree um, in, in, in season, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Or I'm sorry, when it says that a fig tree in leaf, it means that he saw a fig tree uh, in, in distance. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. I want to emphasize that because uh, the text clearly says it was not the season for figs. In fact, there's actually a powerful principle that you can pull from this passage, um, but I'm not going to get into that right now. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So Jesus, he basically, he goes to this fig tree. He expects to go get figs from this fig tree because it's a fig tree. It should have figs on it. But Jesus gets upset that there are no figs on it. Now, this actually might seem kind of silly. Jesus sees a fig tree, a fig tree that it is not fig season to be producing figs. And he sees it and he goes up to it and he expects for there to be figs, even though it's not fig season. 
It's like, okay, is Jesus delusional? What's going on? And actually how I've heard this, how I've heard this preached, and I believe that this is an accurate understanding of this text. And now I'll be honest, this is open for debate for us to say whether or not this is uh, the interpretation of the text. But I believe that this to be a possible teaching here is that Jesus was upset because this fig tree did not meet the expectation of his faith. He expected for there to be figs uh, on that fig tree, and it did not meet the ex expectation of his faith. Therefore, he cursed the fig tree. He cursed the fig tree because it did not meet his expectation of faith. I think that that is a fair understanding of that text, and I'll show you why in a couple verses now. Go to Mark chapter 11, verse 20. So we're skipping down to verse 20. So Jesus, he tells the fig tree, may you never produce fruit again. That's what he says. He curses the fig tree. Here's what happens. As, and by the way, that was a confession. Jesus said, may you never produce fruit again. He said something, he confessed something. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus said something to the fig tree. He said, may you never produce, uh, uh, will you never produce fruit again? Or may no one ever eat of your fruit again? And what happened? They went back and the fig tree that he cursed, what happened? It withered up and died. Why? The power of his confession. He said something and it happened. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't say, Yes, this happened because I'm the son of God and I'm Jesus and I'm God manifested in the flesh. And so I said it. And so because I said it, it had to be so because I am God. That's not what Jesus said. He actually says something completely different. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Wow. Wow. It'll be done for them. Think about this. I want to show you this. It says, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever, 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 if you're watching this uh, recording, I want you to go ahead and write this in the comments, right? Whoever. Whoever, it doesn't say Jesus just talking about himself. He says, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. People that don't believe in positive confession have a problem right now. People that don't believe in the words of your mouth uh, doing something have a problem right here because Jesus says, whoever says Whoever says, whatever he says, he makes it clear that he is talking about the confession of our mouth and that when we say for something to happen, that we can believe that it's going to happen. The confession of our mouth ought to produce something. The confession of our mouth should produce something. The, the, the confession of our mouth does produce something. What you say matters. You can say unto this mountain, Jesus gives the illustration of a mountain, of a massive structure, and he says, even if you say unto a mountain, may you be lifted up and cast into the sea and don't doubt in your heart, it'll be done unto you. Even a mountain, think about that. If a mountain, this big massive thing, maybe the biggest thing in nature that we can think of. Mount, think about how big Mount Kilimanjaro is or uh, think about how big Mount Everest is. Think about how big those mountains are. Jesus says, have faith in God. You could even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and cast into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, it will really be done unto you. Wow. So think about it like this. If I could say it to a mountain, what else can I say it to? I could say it to any problem that I might face in life. Because if I could say it to one of the biggest things of nature, then I could say it to anything else that I might be facing in life. I could say to sickness, may you be lifted up and go in Jesus' mighty name. I could say to lack, may you be lifted up and go in Jesus' mighty name. I could say to whatever spiritual mountain may be in my way, uh, way may you be lifted up and cast it into their sea. Too many people in Christianity trying to be mountain climbers instead of mountain movers. Trying to climb mountains well, as we climb the mountains of life, 
I, I don't find being a mountain climber in the scriptures. I find being a mountain mover. Mountain mover. Mountain mover. We are not mountain climbers. We are mountain movers. We are not mountain climbers. We are mountain movers. Hear that and make a note of that. You are not meant to climb mountains as a Christian. You are meant to use the authority Jesus has given you and speak and say, may you be lifted up and cast into the sea. That's what you were meant to do as a Christian. That is the power of your confession. Your confession matters. Your confession matters. So Jesus seemed to think that confession was biblical, that what you say actually does matter. Because see, we can debate all we want about if confession, you know, you know, confession, you know, should we really confess? Do, do our words really matter? We can debate it all we want. But if we believe that the Bible is the word of God, then clearly the Bible says, and even Jesus here says, that you could say unto this mountain. And Jesus clearly says, but believes that what he says will come to pass. Jesus clearly makes it about confession. I think I've made my point clear. Jesus clearly teaches confession. The words of your mouth very clearly matter. Very clearly matter. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. I want to show you this. Show you this. Here's why it's so important that we know the word of God with our confession. That we know the word of God with our confession. We can only confess something. So while we understand at this point that confession is biblical, we have to understand how we ought to confess, how we ought to confess. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Why do I read this verse? Because the uh, writer of Hebrews, who we are not certain who it is. Some people believe it was Paul. Some people believe it was other people. But the writer of Hebrews says, he has said, he being God, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so since God has said that, we can confidently say that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I can make that confession that the Lord is my helper because I know that he'll never leave me or forsake me. I can make a confession based upon what is found in the word of God. I'm not going to confess something that is not founded in the scriptures. I'm going to confess things that are founded in the word of God. Our confession needs to be based upon the scriptures. Don't be someone that goes around confessing things that the Bible does not say. We have to base our confession on the word of God. What does this look like practically? Let me encourage you with this, that if you are, uh, uh, something that I like to do is that I make confessions every single day. I have a list of confessions that I will confess over myself. And this is actually something that I did more when I was in college and I've recently began to do again be, uh, because I believe in the power of our confession. So what I'll do is I'll make these confessions and next to each of my confessions, I have a scripture that goes with it. I have a scripture. I said, thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue that rises up in judgment against me will be proven wrong. I'm literally confessing the scripture. I'll say, Lord, thank you that I walk in healing. Why? Because Matthew 8, 16 through 17, I cite scriptures next to my confession. My confession is based upon the word of God. I'm not like confessing these like weird things like, Lord, thank you that tomorrow uh, tomorrow I'm going to be caught up to the third heaven and I'm going to see seven cherubim and four seraphim flying up in the heavens. I, I don't make those types of confessions because there's nowhere in the word of God that those things are founded. We can also take this in the direction, be careful what you confess because you only want to confess what the Bible says. 
AJ, who is stepping into the uh, youth leader and eventually youth pastoring role at our uh, Impact Wolke campus, uh, he's stepping uh, into that position and um, at uh, Impact, and he probably is watching this podcast because he watches the podcast faithfully, and he's doing a great job, and I'm very proud of him and everything that he's doing. He preached a great sermon about speaking God's word, and he basically said either speak God's word or be quiet. Either speak what is in agreement with God's word or be quiet. And, and, and I love that he said that because it's so true. And I've heard other great people of God make similar uh, statements about being mindful of what we say. I want my confession to always match the word of God. I don't want my confession to be outside the Bible. I'm not going to confess that I'm poor because I'm rich. I'm not going to confess that I lack things because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want I'm not going to confess lack over my life. I'm not going to confess that I'm never going to see a harvest in my life. I'm not going to confess that I don't have seed because the Bible says that he supplies seed to the sower. I'm not going to confess that I'm sick because the Bible says that I'm healed. I'm going to make sure that my words, that the confession of my mouth matches what the Bible says. Because if I want to see what the Bible says in my life, I need to confess what the Bible says in my life. Why? Why? Because I think that that's an important question to answer. Why? Okay, well, if the Bible says it, why, why can't I have it without my confession? If I, if I confess something contrary to the scriptures, then why can't I have it? Why, uh, why can't I have, why, why won't I have what the scriptures say if I confess something contrary to the scriptures? That's a fair question to ask. Well, the first answer to that is what I said earlier. As a man believes in his heart, so is he. And I said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you speak out of your mouth is actually rooted in what's in your heart. What you speak out of, out of your mouth is actually rooted in what is in your heart. Your confession will actually, will ensure that we actually have faith. Go to Mark 5. I want to show you this. Go to Mark 5. Mark chapter 5. Your confession will actually show if you have faith. Your confession will show if you actually have faith. One of the reasons for this, again, is, uh, is for what the scripture that I keep on quoting, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're saying, I'm believing God for this, I'm believing God for that, but then the confession of your mouth is opposite. You tell somebody in a conversation, yeah, you know, I'm just really believing God for this. Okay, good, you're making a good confession here, but then you're having a conversation later on and you say something in contradiction to that confession. We have to be careful what comes out of our mouth. At the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But watch this, Mark chapter five, verse 25. It says, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Notice this. She didn't just, uh, she di uh, didn't just want to be healed, but she actually had a confession within her that if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be whole. You see, you have to understand that, that our confession, our confession, will actually show if we believe in God. Go to James chapter five. I want to show, or James chapter one. I want to show this further. Go to James chapter one. I want to show this further. I really want to build a strong argument for biblical confession and help you understand it uh, so, that you'll see, so that you'll see better results in your life. The Bible says in James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting 
For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is, double, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The Bible says that when we ask God, let him ask in faith, not doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. And it says that a double-minded man should expect to receive nothing from the Lord. If I, on one end, uh, say or want to believe God for something, but on the other end, I'm confessing something else, I'm a double-minded man and I can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. If in one way, I'm wanting to believe God that I'm going to have a successful career, I'm believing God that I'm going to have a successful career and my finances are going to be blessed. If I'm believing God for that, and I'm like, okay, I'm believing my finances to be blessed. I'm sowing, I'm doing everything that the Bible tells me to do. But then I'm confessing, yeah, to be honest with you, it's probably always going to be like this. Yeah, I don't know if my harvest is really ever going to come. Your confession is double-minded. So uh, is you're, you're a double-minded man. You're, you're saying one thing here and another thing there. You're trying to believe one thing in your heart, but you're confessing something different in your mouth. There is a divide that is taking place, and the Bible says a double-minded man should expect to receive nothing from the Lord. So we have to be mindful about these things. If we really want to believe God for something, we need to have our confession matched with what we are believing for. We have to understand that part of belief is our confession. Part of belief is our confession. We don't, we're not really acting in belief if our confession does not match it. We're not really acting in belief if our confession does not match what we say we are believing for. See, faith is outward and it's inward. Faith is outward and it's inward. When we say that we're believing God for something, there is an inward belief that we must have for something. But then there is also outward action that follows. The woman with the issue of blood, she had an inward belief and an inward confession, and then she had outward action to be able to back it up. In the same way, it should be for us when we're believing God for something. We should have inward belief, but we should also have outward action. This actually leads to something very important. We cannot simply just confess something and believe that it's going to happen if our actions do not support our confession. See, some people take positive confession too far. They confess, you know, I'm going to, you know, they confess, I'm going to be healthy and whole in Jesus' mighty name. But then they sit on their couch and eat five bags of chips every single day and never exercise and don't do anything with their life. You can't confess something where you're disobedient with God and God's word in. You can't confess something and then be disobedient uh, to, to God's word. That's not how it works. We have to have our life be in full obedience to God's word. Our obedience and our confession need to go hand in hand. If I'm working out, if I'm eating the right things, and then I'm confessing, I'm going to be healthy and whole in Jesus' mighty name. Now I can really confess that and believe that because I'm in accordance with God's word. I can't say, thank you, uh, thank you, Lord, that you're going to provide all my needs, but then not have a job. Because I remember my podcast, be a hard worker and get a job. The Bible is very clear that we need to be hard at work. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, it talks about being a hard worker. The apostle Paul says that they worked with their hands as an example. So we need to be hard workers as, as Christians, but if I'm not being a hard worker, I can't confess over my life uh, that my finances are going to be blessed and that I'm going to be, you know, living in the blessing of God if I'm not working. Why? Because I'm not in accordance with God's word. I can confess until the cows come home. There's one of my old sayings that nobody understands what that means. But anyway, I can confess all that I want is basically what I'm trying to say. You can confess all that you want, but until you change your actions, that confession won't become a reality. But watch this. It's the same thing for our actions. If I try to do something, but I confess something else, I will never outrun my confession. I can work as hard as I want, but if the confession of my mouth is that my finances are never going to be blessed, then I'm never going to get to a point where my finances are blessed. Our confession and our obedience to God's word go hand in hand. We cannot have one without the other. We will not live in the fullness of God's word without confession and obedience in God's word going hand to hand. This will, this will help you. 
Because some people wonder why they never get to a high place in God. And something that I would ask them is, first, are you doing the things that the Bible says that you should do and being in obedience with your word? Okay, good. But then how is your confession? It's no surprise that people that say that they're tired all the time are tired. It's no surprise that people that have a poverty mindset and confess poverty live in poverty. It's no surprise that people that confess that they never have energy to do anything, never have energy to do anything. We have to be mindful of our confession. You will not be able to outrun your confession. Those of you that are called to the ministry, if you confess that you're, it's going to be a struggle for you to get going in ministry and it's going to be a struggle for you to do great things for God, then it will be a struggle for you to do great things for God. But if you confess, I'm going to do great things for God, I'm going to do mighty things for God, and then you have the actions and the obedience to God's word to support that confession, you're going to thrive like crazy. You're going to thrive like crazy. Confession and obedience to God's word, hand in hand. Confession is not a substitute for obedience to God's word. Nor is obedience a substitute for confession of God's word. They go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. It's kind of like uh, with working out. Something that people can get frustrated with is they work out a lot, and, but they don't change their diet. Therefore, they struggle to lose weight. And it's like, I'm working out every day for an hour, but why am I not losing weight? And the answer is because they're eating 4,000 calories. But then if they go to the, uh, but then, you know, some people, if they go to the other extreme and they barely eat any food and, but then they decide that they're not going to work out. Yeah, they might lose some weight, but they're not going to be as healthy because they're not going to be building any more muscle. They need to go hand in hand. Exercise, work, uh, exercise, diet, hand in hand. In the same way, confession, obedience, hand in hand. It's a perfect recipe where you could see success take place in your life. Confession is very clearly a biblical thing. Confession is very clearly a biblical thing. And I want you to uh, be able to understand that. Not only is it silly to say that confession is not of the Bible, you cannot be saved without confession. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. There is a belief that needs to take place and there is a confession that needs to take place. That Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible actually teaches confession as a means in which salvation is obtained. So confession is very clearly a biblical thing. Don't let people lie to you and say, yeah, you know, let, like positive confession. It really doesn't matter what you say. It'll just be however God wants it to be. Because that's where people uh, start to miss it is they say, well, my confession doesn't matter because whatever God wants to happen will happen. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches our actions actually influencing what takes place in the earth. The Bible actually teaches us acting and doing what the Bible says that we should do. Are you saying, Pastor Joey, that we are God? and that, uh, that we are God. No, I'm saying that God decided to give us free will. And with that free will, we have a choice to be able to make, to be able to see the course of our life go one way or the other. And your confession is one of them. As I've continually said, your confession, your confession will determine where you go. Listen to this. Your confession can actually cancel out your actions. Your confession can actually cancel out your action. I'll prove it to you. And for sake of time, I'll reference the text. The 12 spies, what did they do? They went into the land to check out the land. They took an action step to go check out the land that God had promised to them. And so they go into the land. They go and take the action step of checking it out. But then what happens? They come back. 10 people confess that they cannot take the land. Two people confess, Joshua and Caleb, that they can take the land. Joshua and Caleb had confession. They said, surely at once we'll go and take the land. They had confession and actions coupled together. You can go to Numbers 13 and 14 and read this entire story and see what I'm talking about. They had confession and they had action. The other people, they had the action part. They went and they went to go check out the land, but then they came back and their confession did not match the thing that they just did. And so what happened as a result? 
the entire community began to weep and wail and all this type of stuff and began to speak against the fact that they can go take the land that God had promised. And you know what happened? They had exactly as their confession said, that they can't take the land. God said, okay, you'll wander in the wilderness now for 40 years. But guess what happened? Joshua and Caleb, the people that said, no, or we can take this land. The ones that had the action and the confession, they were able to inherit the promised land. They were the only two from that generation that were able to inherit the promised land. Your confession. Your confession can cancel out your actions. But when you put confession and action together, it is a perfect perfect recipe to receive everything that God has for you. When God promises you something in his word, Let your action and your confession follow what the word of God says. God told them the land is yours. They acted, Joshua and Caleb, they acted and they confessed that. Then then they received the land. They received what God had promised. Let your action and confession line up with God's word. Let your action and confession line up with God's word. There are many people in the Bible that that, uh, show us confession. That was just one example of positive confession coming into play. People say it's not biblical. It's all over the place in the scriptures. I'll give you a couple more references. If you go to Genesis chapter 22, verse five, I'm going to reference this real quick, just for sake of time. I want to rattle these things off because I have Bible study that I need to go get to. Genesis 22, five, God tells Abram to go and to sacrifice his son on the mountain. Abraham or Abram at the time was his name, says to his servant right before he goes up to sacrifice his son and do what God told him to do. He says, wait here, me and the boy will be right back. I'm paraphrasing. He says, we will be right back. We will go up to the mountain and worship the Lord and then we will come back. Who's we? Him and his son. He knew that he was going to come back with his son. He confessed that he was going to come back with his son. He understood and he had an awareness that of the test that God was giving to him of obedience. And he confessed, we will come back. Confession. Another example of this, Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. God speaks to Joshua and says, surely I have given you this land. I have given you this city. Speaking of Jericho, he says, I have given you uh, Jericho. I have given you this city. And then what does Joshua do? If you go to Joshua chapter 6, Verse 16, I'm going to read this one. Joshua chapter 6, verse 16. After Joshua had listened to all the instructions that God had given to him, there's the action point. See, there's the action point of it, because remember, it's action and confession together. Joshua chapter 6, verse 16. It says, and at the seventh time, When the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you this city. There's that confession again. They did everything that God had commanded. He told them to march around the walls seven times on seven different days. And then on the last day, seven times on that day total. And he had given them instructions to follow after they did the action. Then Joshua said, shout for the Lord has given us this city. He confessed it. What happened? They acted, they confessed, God gave them that city. Confession, there it is again in the Bible. Another example, and the last example I'll give of confession, is actually from an angel of the Lord. Gideon, in Judges chapter 6, verse 11 through 12, you can go and and look it up. The Bible says that Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. He was threshing wheat in a wine press. And the reason why he, and uh, this was a peculiar thing that he was doing because you would thresh wheat on a threshing floor, not a wine press during Bible times. What does that mean? Well, a threshing floor uh, would basically, what would happen is that the wheat would go through this threshing floor and the good part of the wheat would go in one direction and the bad part of the wheat would go off the end of the mountain and that was called the chaff and it would go off the end of the mountain and it would basically be separated. I'm trying to think of what a good example of this would be. It would kind of be like an egg. 
If you're trying to eat egg whites, where you would separate the egg yolk from the egg white. It was like, okay, I'm going to separate the chaff, the stuff I don't want from the wheat, which is what I do want. And so he was threshing this, uh, this wheat, but he was choosing to do it on a wine press. Why was he choosing to do it on a wine press? Well, let me give you a little bit of understanding in history. And I promise you, this is going to lead ba back to uh, confession. He was doing it because uh, he, uh, he was on top of a hill, on top of a mountain. And in the valley, there were some people that uh, were threatening to attack, uh, attack Gideon and his people on the mountain. And here's the thing. The threshing floor was on top of the mountain. And when he would thresh wheat, all of the chaff would begin to go off the mountainside. So what was happening is Gideon was actually afraid to thresh the wheat on the threshing floor because he didn't want them to see the chaff that was going off the mountainside and signal for them to come and attack them. He, didn't, he was basically doing it in this wine press that was hidden because the wine press, it was in a hidden place that, was, uh, that, the, that the enemy could not see him. And so he did it in the wine press to hide from the enemy so that they didn't see the chaff that was coming off the side of the mountain. Now, why do I explain all of that? And that was uh, the quickest way that I can explain. I hope that it made sense to the best of, uh, best of my ability. Uh, I hope that it made sense. But the point in me explaining that was because then in the next verse, the Bible tells us, an angel of the Lord comes and says, Gideon, mighty man of valor, or mighty man of bravery. Okay, what's your point? Gideon was not being brave by threshing wheat in a wine press and hiding from the enemy. He was actually being the opposite. He was hiding from the enemy. He was being cowardly. Yet God confesses to him. An angel of the Lord comes and confesses to him. Oh, mighty man of valor. What is happening? God is confessing as he sees Gideon, not as he is. There is confession taking place even from an angel of the Lord. Confession in the Bible. Once again. And we see a powerful principle in that, obviously, that God calls us as he sees us, not as we currently are, or he calls us as to what he sees us doing, not as we currently are. But there's confession again in the Bible. There is confession all throughout the scriptures. And these were just some of the examples that I gave you of confession. We would be here for a much longer period of time if I went through every single point in which there is confession in the Bible. But those are just some of the examples. Confession is a biblical thing, as I've shown you through many texts of the scriptures. And your confession does matter. Make sure you understand biblical confession. Make sure you confess the right things over your life. I'll leave you on this. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Don't give the devil something to accuse you of. Don't confess something that gives the enemy room to accuse you. Be someone that confesses faith and that confesses what the word of God says. Confession is biblical. Confession is biblical. Make sure that your words match what you're believing God for. Well, I hope that that teaching blessed you. I hope that you understood more about confession. And I hope that you mind what you say. If you ever catch yourself confessing something, uh, confessing something so, and, and, uh, that, that you don't want to believe for, you can very quickly correct it. Uh, I've said dumb things before with my mouth and I've said, you know what? Actually, no, I'm not going to confess that. I'm going to confess this instead. Instead, sometimes it, it, it's, uh, it takes a little bit of time for people to switch a mindset in this because some people can be very negative. Everything's uh, doom and gloom, but maybe you're hearing this teaching now and you're deciding from today forward, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to teach doom and gloom anymore. I'm not going to teach like, or I'm not going to speak doom and gloom, not teach. I'm not going to speak doom and gloom over myself anymore. It might take some time to adjust in that. Anytime you catch yourself saying something that's not of God, correct yourself. Say, no, I'm not going to confess that. I'm going to confess this instead. Amen. Hope that blessed you. And I hope to see you again on the Uncanceled podcast next week. I'm so happy to be back with you guys with this teaching. God bless. Thank you for listening to the Uncanceled Podcast. We hope you are blessed and encouraged by the teaching today. 
If you are between the grades of 5th through 12th grade, make sure to check us out in person at Faith Church in New Milford, Connecticut every Wednesday night from 6.30 to 9 p.m. Be sure to tune in next week for another weekly podcast from Uncanceled. God bless.